<laughs> yes. Good morning. This gives me... Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are. Absolutely, that is true. Welcome to the official beginning of the event. And uh, do we have this? Yes, okay. So, greetings and welcome. We have another Beyond Borders session today. I'm Dr. Mandana Donahue. And if you are new to Oral Pathology 360, you have to know that we are, uh, I should tell you that we are all about, of course, oral pathology, but with a 360 view. That includes oral medicine, oral surgery, dentistry, and of course, patients. This is a list of the places you can connect with us and find details of all the programs we conduct. We have a weekly live stream uh, on Tuesdays, which is called Oral Pathology Tuesdays. So coming to chronic mechanical irritation as a causative factor for oral cancer, it has been around for the longest time. And if you were studying oral cancer beginning somewhere at the late 80s, you have already heard about it or thought about it because there was this concept of the five S's of uh, that caused oral cancer, which was smoking, spirits, uh, sharp teeth, syphilis, and sun. Now that list has been modified, added to, reduced, replaced, uh, and the quest really continues. But as dentists, the role of sharp teeth or appliances leading to chronic mechanical irritation as a cause of cancer has a way of sort of sticking in one's mind. It's one of those things that are just too difficult and too real to let go, but never really established. Today, we, ha we have with us someone who clearly did not let go. And in fact, Dr. Jeronim, sorry, Jeronimo Lezos from Argentina <laughs> <Please>. has <laughs> yeah, go on. tried trying has tenaciously spent the last 25 years examining the possible role with his team. He even got his PhD on the topic, making him one of the handful of experts on the topic. And he is going to share everything known, established and yet to be established on the role of chronic mechanical irritation and oral cancer. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Lazos. It is a privilege. Yes, so for me also, yes. And we always have an expert, and today also we have an expert. And today our expert is Dr. Tilak Ratne. He is going to wrap up everything and bring in the wider oral cancer pathogenesis knowledge. Uh, well, uh, we everybody really knows uh, Dr. Tilak Ratne, and certainly anyone who is in this sort of a gathering or any gathering about oral cancer, because he is one of the leading figures on oral cancer research. And on the off chance you do not know him, but you should, you should check out. Yes. And he has yeah. got over, <laughs> yes, he has over 140 published papers, a multitude of talks. Many of them are also on the web. And he's been an expert, uh, I mean, very widely known global expert on oral cancer. He has been on our channel as the expert, mostly on oral cancer many times, and also has promised to do a full lecture once the WHO blue book for which he is one of the editors finishes. Uh, he has, of course, numerous academic, scholastic and professional achievements. And they are all, all very great. But in my book, what really makes him great besides all that is the fact that is his love for the subject and the fact that he is always so reachable. He, it is, uh, he always really goes out of his way to help out and to be there. And uh, he has been with us. I cannot even count the number of times he has helped me with the channel. So I'm very happy to have you here, sir. As always, a great privilege. Thank you so much. And with that, let me just say, let's start. Hello and um, welcome to everybody. Today, we are going to talk about what is one of our main lines of research, chronic mechanical irritation, what we are now begin to call CMI and oral cancer. In this regard, it is important to note that we are referring to precisely oral squamous cell carcinoma when we talk about oral cancer here. 
First and foremost, we, I, I would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Mandana Dologi for the invitation, and particularly to Professor Tilegalakne for sparing some time to be with us and share its, his knowledge. So, without further ado, let's go. <laughs> well, here we have a broad view of what we are about to discuss from how the topic came to be, how to define and identify CMI, and also to give some key clinical features for CM CMI. Later on, we are going to delve deep into the existing body of research, the current body of research, the epidemiological, experimental evidence, evidence and some systematic reviews that has been published. Then we will mention the proposed bi biological mechanisms of CMI to prompt malignant transformation. And we also are going to take a moment to mention research limitations imposed by the nature of chronic mechanical irritation. Finally, to close with its clinical relevance, future prospects and conclusions. So we currently think oral squamous cell carcinoma, OSCC, as being multifactorial. So a constant interaction between the different factors, such as age, sex, tobacco and alcohol consumption, and many others, takes place for the malignant transformation process to happen. Within the so-called dental factors, we have chronic mechanical irritation, CMI, which has been indeed mentioned in a recent textbook about oral cancer published by Dr. Saman Guanacolosurisha and John Grispan in 2020. Well, the hypothesis that chronic trauma could be linked to oral cancer is not by any means new. In the 20th century, Martin et al. already, su already suggested the, the possibility of this association already stating the ubiquity of the so-called dental factors in tongue cancer patients. Tobacco and alcohol are considered the major risk factors for oral cancer. However, they could not cause the totality of oral cancers. What's more, there are individuals unexposed to those that still develop malignant lesions. Thus, there has to be other risk factor for oral cancer and chronic mechanical irritation has been mentioned as being potentially being one of them. So the first published studies dealing with the relationship between trauma and OSCC were expert opinions and mostly case reports. In the first half of the 20th century, irritation produced by teeth or dentures was already considered a potential cause for oral cancer, mainly in the tongue. This was followed later on by other publications and for many years, the available evidence was on this very same kind basic level. It was not until the 20,000s that the research began, began to take proper shape. So let's, let's see first, what is to be considered trauma? What is considered to be chronic mechanical irritation? How we define it? Mechanical irritation was first known as, or, or mentioned as trauma. However, chronic mechanical irritation refers particularly to the repetitive damaging action of the on the oral mucosa produced by a mechanical agent. From our point of view, the criteria for identification of chronic mechanical irritation has three parts, and they all have to be found in order to CMI to be positive in a patient. First, energetic clinical lesion compatible with mechanical origin should be found, and it has to be over a month of evolution for it to be considered chronic. Here you have uh, a box with the po possible lesion, there are many of them. 
Well, this is what we call the objective lesion criteria. It, it has to be said that we are referring to a long-standing and continuous action, not to a, an occasional or accidental one-time bite. Second one, the mechanical injury agent should be in the oral cavity before the onset of the lesion to fulfill the temporality principle, which is First, there has to be the cause, in this case, the mechanical agent, then the consequence, the lesion. This is what we call the temporality criteria. Third and last, the traumatic agent must be in direct contact with the lesion, is what we call the topographic functional criteria. Hmm. So during functional, parafunctional movements, such as solid disorder, tone thrush, etc. We are going to discuss that late, later part a little bit later on. Well, in this context, a broken or defective tooth or denture does not equal CMI, a CMI lesion. An individual could have many broken defective teeth or dentures and not show any association lesion, lesion whatsoever. This is important because we are going to see that some of the research about the topic use uh, somehow heterogeneous criteria, particularly mention this one. So I think it's important to mention this. The number of irritative factors does not equal a lesion, a traumatic lesion. So to give you an example, of, of a case positive for CMI. We have in the left side, the lesion in the buccal mucosa, a, a extended lesion. And on the right, you can see the mechanical factor. In this case, a denture, a defective denture, yes. In, and, you, as, and you can see you have the lesion, we have the factor, they are both in contacts. And this particular case, the patient related that this denture was, he was using it four years, for more than four years, and the very first day that the dentist gave the patients the denture, he began to fall, to feel some uncomfort in, in this place. So we can say this is chronic, he has a lesion, he has a factor, and they are both in contact. This fulfills completely the CMI cr criteria. Well, talking about some clinical features, the CMI factors, we classify the factors able or capable to produce mechanical irritation in three groups. The fixer factors, the ones that we were, we call previously refer as dental, the ones that could not be taken off by the patient, mainly teeth with some defective teeth or even implants. The second important group are the removal or prosthetic factors, mostly uh, defective dentures, but some uh, we have seen some patients with removal or trodontic that also develop lesions. And the latter, the functional factors, offers feasibility of damage increasing contact frequency and strength. This, we believe, could explain why not all patients having potentially harmful mechanical factors develop lesions. We, we have seen many times in our clinic that a patient presents having a lot of mechanical factors, a potential mechanical factors, but they don't have a lesion. Therefore, we, we believe that functional factors enable the persistence of the mechanical injury, sometimes being necessary to the patient to develop a lesion. Well, regarding the, the last one that you can see, this betel quid chewing, we do not have personal experience on it, but we would like to ask our colleague, our colleagues with first-hand knowledge, of course, Dr. Mandana, Dr. Tila Karakne, that 
if uh, betel quid chewing could be considered a mechanical factor disregarding the other harmful effects that are well known because of betel chewing. Well, speaking of uh, uh, CMMI factor distribution, as you can see, we have here three groups. The first one is the one we call benign irritative mechanical lesions, which are all the lesions produced by trauma, except mm, excluding chronic traumatic ulcer. Mm. We believe that this uh, mechanical lesion is distinctive for many reasons that we are going to discuss, but we take it, we study it separate. And the third group is the oral squamous cell carcinoma. As you can see, the column in, in light blue is the, are the dental or fixer factors that uh, are the most frequent in all groups. But what we are, I like to emphasize, the high frequency of functional factors, more than 75 in the total, suggests they are, that they are of relevance too. So we believe that the functional factors play a key role for uh, CMI lesions to develop. It has to be patients most of our patients presents a combined factors, not only have dental of uh, denture factor, but also in most of our patients, the functional factor is present, allowing mm, the persistence of the factor on the, and the irritation. So regarding localization of CMI lesions, they arise usually at from a trauma prone site, such as lip, tongue, buccal mucosa, or close to a dental, almost half of them, 45, if, as you can see here, are located on the lateral border of the tongue. And here, they are usually in relation with fixed factors. On the other hand, buccal mucosa, with 42%, there, the lesions are mostly explained by removable factors. In addition, in the graphic on the right, yes, this is from a study we published some years ago. As you can see, we have the same frame group, benign irritative mechanical lesions, chronic traumatic ulcer, and oral cancer. As you can see, both CTU and O OSCC show preference on tongue and buccal mucosa. They share up to a point the same local localization preference both, which is slightly different from the sites affected by the rest of the mechanical lesions. Hmm? Of course, excluding CTU. Well, um, we can see that all squamous cell carcinoma have a longer time of exposition. What we mean by expo exposure time is referred specifically to the time that the oral mucosa has been exposed to the, this damaging action. As you can see in the first group, benign irritative mechanical lesions has had less time than chronic traumatic ulcer. And then the oral cancer is the one that has the most prolonged sustained exposition to the factors with a mean of 49 months, with which somehow could su suggest a dose effect relationship at least regarding time. Also, this has to be mentioned, removable factors show a longer time span in all groups with a statistically significant difference, as you can see here. So there are uh, difference in the time of action of CMI. This could be because uh, fixed factors, the ones that could not be removed by the patient, are not modifiable, thus acting without interruption. So you can see the benign lesions, the lesions that are most reactive, most, most common, have the less time. In the middle, we have chronic traumatic ulcer, and with the most exposition time, we have oral cancer. 
Well, you may think that uh, maybe we only see CMI lesions here in Argentina, but uh, in in the past, in 2020, we have been we have in part a webinar on this precise topic, and later we did a a, a little question and. Uh, to the participants that were from all around the world, from India, Indonesia, Nepal, Malaysia, Taiwan, Mexico, Ecuador, and many more. And we have asked them in, in, if in their professional practice, how often do you see CMI lesions? And as you can see, more than 70% of them have seen at least mechanical lesion at least one a month or once a week. So as you can see, uh, as you can probably guess, uh, traumatic lesions are very, very common in our current clinical setting. So, what are the lesions that are related to CMI? We have divided them in two groups. Mechanical irritation could directly produce a wide array of lesions, as we can see in the group on the left. Within this group, hmm, we have annotations, morsicatio bucarum, fibrous hyperplasia, and we believe that of this group, CTU, chronic traumatic ulcer, could be the lesion with malignant transformation potential. In contrast, mechanical irritation could modify, could alter some pre-existing diseases that the patient have, changing their evolution and phenotype, such as oral potentially malignant disorders, such as leukoplakia, oral lichen planus, and oral submuc submucous fibrosis. Again, we don't have the right experience on that, but we have found some reference. And of course, we have to mention, we believe that maybe CMI could, could be involved in some cases Mm. En enhancing the possibility of malignant transformation. So, to, to present some clinical examples, this is one of the lesions belonging to the first group, the, to the CMI produced lesions. Here we have, if we remember, the three criteria. We have the lesion, mm, axophytic lesion, we have the factor, in this case, this case uh, diastema, and some sharp, sharp teeth. The patient also develop a habit of suction in this place. The missing teeth was absent for more than three years. So we have the lesion, we have the factor, we have contact between them and we have temporality. So this fulfills all three criteria, this is a common lesion, the fibrous hyperplasia. So, in this particular case, we have a patient who had two implants that the one of the left lost the attach, and the patient um, recalled that when the attach was, was loose, the implant began to, to, to damage the floor of the mouth, when, this, when the patient talk, when the patient eat something, and we have, we can, as we can see here, we have a lesion, hmm, a big lesion, hmm, an, an ominous phenotype, and we have the factor. When we ask the patient to talk, we have, we can corroborate there, there was contact between the lesion and the factor. And in this case, the, the factor is fixed, not, not a teeth, but an implant. Again, this fulfills all criteria. Well, another CMI produced lesion, but this one mm, referring to a defective denture. This is very common, at least in where people use uh, removal dentures, particularly the full dentures, mm, when they they are not stable. They are uh, they are, they have rough surfaces and they are. They have mobility. If the patient keeps using it at, for an interrupted time, 
it can develop a denture induces fibrous hyperplasia and also in this particular case a chronic traumatic ulcer as you can see we have the lesion we have the denture in direct contact and the patient clearly remembers because he felt pain when this appliance was given to him it, it in the very same day that he began to use it he feel he feel uncomfortable he feel pain and the lesion developed again we fulfill here the three criteria for defining cmi so all in all you may be asking yourself could all cmi lesions be associated with oral squamous cell carcinoma as you may guess the answer obviously is no because not all cmi lesions are created equal cmi effects could range from a moderate epithelial response only to a more evident tissue tissue injury like an ulcer as you can see in the later photo only the ones we believe that only the ones that produce both a persistent hyperproliferative status and chronic inflammation could be related to carcinogenesis. So, to be crystal clear, we do not believe that each and every one of the CMI produced lesions could develop cancer, only this last one. So, could chronic traumatic ulcer be considered an oral potentially malignant disorder? To the best of our knowledge, Grispan, not this is David Grispan, an Argentinian, not to confuse with John Grispan, yes? In 1970, was the first to mention specifically CTU as a trauma-induced lesion, a lesion produced by a persistent and repetitive injury as a lesion with malignant potential. Later on, some publication mostly re case reports and a few cross-sectional studies also mention CTU as a pro prospective precursor lesion for OSCC. CTU is the prototypical lesion caused by CMI and it has been mentioned to be an, maybe an undervalued oral potentially malignant lesion. And because of that, uh, it, it is not, not usually recorded in epidemiological studies about oral cancer and oral malignant transformation. So even for a well-trained oral medicine expert, it is challenging in a case such as this to point out exactly a, di a diagnosis. Could be this be an early oral cancer could be a CTU? Well, in this particular case, on the biopsy, the lesion had features of both in the histopathology. Mm, had unspecific ulcer features of we we like to call non-healing CTU, non-healing chronic traumatic ulcer. And in the lower border, it shows some features of microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma. So this poses us a question because there, there are no studies that uh, directly deal with this particular association, this specific lesion, not all traumatic lesions, but only CTU. So in order to seek an answer for this, we decided to carry on a study about chronic traumatic ulcer and malignant transformation. So this, uh, this is a study that it has been recently accepted for publication. And when, I, when I say recently, I mean like four days ago, that a study that we were able to, to do with Professor Saman Guanacolzulija. This is a retropestic retropestic study mm, that in, in what we include only CTU with provisional clinical di diagnosis, excluding patients who have another oral potential malignant lesions. So we study patients only with this kind of lesions and nothing else. 
what we do we, do, we, we first receive the patients at, as you can see in the graphic here initially we have a group of 107 patients we proceed to remove all the sources of trauma all the traumatic factors and we perform a follow-up if the particular lesion show no healing or the healing took place but only partial in a partial fashion we practice a biopsy so in the follow-up we do a biopsy of 32 lesions and of all the, of those lesions two of them which accounts to one point 87 percent show both features of all squamous cell carcinoma and non-specific ulcer what we call an initial a microinvasive cancer so this could be the first step in order to talk about ctu maybe posing mm, a potential for malignant transformation so, to, in order to present to you some clinical cases of oral cancer, yes, we have here a patient with of 53 years old. Mm. Then on the right, in the left, you, you can see the lesion. Mm. But if you, if you refer your attention to the picture on the right, you can see that the patient have an injury factor present before the onset of the lesion. It, it has a defective teeth, a defective dentures, both with sharp edge. Mm. The patient mm, uh, recall that he always feel uncomfortable and feel that the both teeth and dentures were harming their, their border of the tongue. So we have a lesion. So we have, again, the first factors. This is a clinical case of oral cancer associated to chronic mechanical irritation. So here the inverted overbite and malposition made the patient <clears throat> unintentionally bite the area for more than three years. So the patient developed this lesion that was biopsy as a squamous cell carcinoma. Here we have a case of a heavy drinker never smoker this is important the, the deletion of the border of the tongue as you can see here was in relation to cmi because of a teeth malposition and also a defective lenser because uh, the patient have have lost the 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 mm, fit, 36, the first inferior uh, left molar. Mm. So the, this bicuspid that was in malposition mm, mm, began to cause some damage to the border of the tongue. Mm. And both the, the denture and the, the teeth were in direct contact and the patient say, remember that this particular uh, area of, of the tongue was always being harmed. So it, uh, for at least 48 months, for two years, four years, sorry. Well, to talk about the second group, the CMI modified lesions. Here we have a patient with oral lichen planus with which had many lesions throughout the, the oral cavity but what we can see in the picture is a uh, part of the buccal mucosa and the the area that, that is erosive that so we can call it erosive lichen, lichen planus was in contact with a defective denture that had mobility and in the patient words he said that the denture scratch the cheek. On the right side, you can see the change in the phenotype only by removing the CMI source. In this case, we remove the denture three weeks after 
And as you can see, it shows a complete resolution of the oscillations. In this case, we did not uh, have any other pharmacological treatment. The only thing we, we did was to remove the denture and see how it goes. As you can see in this particular case, removal of CMI source modified this, the phenotype of the lesion. Well, here we have another interesting case. This patient, despite having several five sites on his mouth affected with leukoplakia, as you can see, is, there are some lesions here, the ventrolateral tongue, yes? But the OSCC developed on the site affected by CNI, where the upper denture had contact with the tongue. The patient developed a habit of pressing the denture upward, but in when it falling down, a habit that the patient uh, recalled that went on for more than two years. So we have a patient with a lot of sites with uh, a leukoplakia, but the cancer developed where the trauma had been acting on. So moving on to the epidemiological evidence. Although currently there is limited evidence on this kind of studies, there are different places of the world that have been studying the association between CMI and oral cancer. The maximum level of evidence available currently, uh, that being systematic reviews and meta-analysis, also have found a positive association between CMI and oral cancer, even to very recent what by Gupta and Pentenero in 2021. Well, a cross-sectional study uh, made by our group, by Piemonte et al., also revealed a significant association between CMI and oral cancer. In this group, it has to be said, we include all three types of CMI factors, the fixed, the removable, and functional factors. F functional factor has been Another study factor for chronic trauma because usually it's not mentioned. In this group, as you can see here, we have the control group and here we have the, the cancer group. The CMI lesion, the CMI, the oral cancer group have a lot of more of irritate, chronic mechanical irritation. But it has to be said that even in the control group, there were a lot of mechanical irritation. All, more than 30% of the patients have some type of mechanical irritation. This was, as you can see, the p-value was showing that it, it was important for both groups. Later, later on, on another study that we conducted, here we have a case control study that further validation, validated this statistical association, despite, even despite the high CMI occurrence on the control group here, as you can see, with CMI we have 30, 36% in the control group. In contrast, the oral cancer group have 45 in presence of CMI. So again, this uh, difference was statistically significant. In the very same study, we, we do a, a multivariate logistic regression. Remarkably, the statistical significance for CMI was maintained in, in this statistical analysis, the multivariate logistic regression analysis, adjusted for age, gender, tobacco, and alcohol. As you can see, the significance was maintained for age, alcohol, and CMI. So, but it has been said, assigning a causal role to CMA to chronic mechanical irritation only in non-smokers or non-drinkers non -drinkers, will dismiss the risk of the interaction between CMI and other factors like tobacco and alcohol 
consumption. In this matter, based on ample published data belonging to the PhD thesis of Dr. Piemonti, chronic trauma may act in combination with other well-known oral cancer risk factors, with me alone the redefinition of oral cancer prevention. So individuals in this study, individuals who with oral cancer in relation with chronic mechanical irritation presented less cumulative consumption of both tobacco and alcohol than the ones without. Thus, if CMI is present, in a minor cumulative consumption of both tobacco and alcohol may be needed in order to develop a CMI. This is very important because, as you, as you know, uh, both of these factors usually are dose dependent. So if a patient that may not be a heavy smoker have trauma, he or she can develop a lesion earlier than the ones without it. So, oh, this is a question that when we discuss the topic with many experts from around the world, they have, have presented us with this question. Could be CMI a consequence of increasing the size of the growth of the tumor? So what they say that uh, the, the cancer could be traumatized because it was bigger, because it, for, for its size, the size was responsible for the, tra for the trauma, not all the way around. So in, the, in this same study, the, the relation between the tumor size and CMI occurrence was assessed. And there were no statistical significant difference between the group qualifying the, the tumors between tumor in situ, T1, T2, T3, and T4. As you can see, there were no significant difference between the, uh, on CMI occurrence between all these groups. This suggests that CMI is not a consequence of cancer growth and, and could be found even at initial stages. So, uh, just to mention one of the, system, the systematic reviews, although currently there is a growing but limited number of studies dealing with the topic, the meta-analysis by Cindy et al. of uh, 2017 supports the relationship between CMI and OSCC, especially regarding ill-fitting dentures. This also means that the sole presence of a denture in a, in a patient is not relating with more risk. There has to be a defective denture. Hmm. The sole presence of a denture in a patient does, does not increase the risk of having a cancer. Well, regarding animal studies, they evenly show an, an association between CMA and oral squamous cell carcinoma. Among them, I want to highlight the, the one by Paris et al. that we find very illustrative of we are going to show. So this study showed the relevance of CMI in the malignant transformation process. And when CMI is present, yes? In which cases there was no cancer. Each row represents a group. Here in the second and the fourth row, you can see patients with that receive CMI producing a chronic traumatic ulcer. And in that group, zero cancers were developed. Also, in the group where only DMBA3, which is a known uh, carcinogenic initiator, as you can see, zero cancer. But on the other hand, when CMI was added to the carcinogenic, see, to DMBA3, CMI defined tumor site, reduced the latency period, and generated tumors that were endophytic, that were more aggressive. So as you can see, the added 
the added effects of uh, carcinogen, whatever it might be, and CMI change the phenotype of the lesion, of the tumor, of the tumor lesion. So, in 2020, 2010, we proposed a theoretical model on the potential pathways for CMI in oral carcinogenesis. We suggested that CMI could act in several stages of the malignant transformation process, but mainly by inducing cellular proliferation and chronic inflammation. Current evidence suggests that chronic trauma may act mainly as a promoter, not mutagenic, not being able to produce mutation. And its effect, and this is very special, is reversible. Mm. So, and also can be mm, associated with tobacco and alcohol. In order to prove that, it, its effect should be found in early stages of malignant transformation. So, this, is, this was a study uh, done by uh, another professor from our group, Dr. Gilligan, that showed that uh, on chronic traumatic ulcer borders, uh, it has been shown that CK, cytokeratin, fifth and five positivity throughout the whole thickness of the epithelium, which may su suggest the presence of immature cells in the superficial layers. And we could enhance or easy the HPV penetration. So, second one that we like to present is key 67. An increase of key 67 expression is found in dysplastic, dysplastic lesions, as you can see even on OSCC. Yeah, and it's associated with the clinical severity of the disease. The increase of cell proliferation due to CMI was previously proposed as predisposing event in a multi-step model of oral carcinogenesis. In this study by Gilligan et al., CTU showed superbasal expression of T67, as you can see, medium or even high in intensity, and could therefore act as cofactor or promoter on malignant transformation. Moreover, the superbasal expression of CK19 on the epithelium borders of CTU are somehow similar to those found in high-grade dispersion, in this case, an OSCC. So, as you can see, we can, we, we can, we are seeing some similarities on the bio, biomolecular characteristic depicted by CTU and OSCC. So, uh, as, as we mentioned before, we believe that CMA may act mainly as a, as a promoter. In order to prove that, hmm, so effects should be present in early stages. Okay. One molecular pathway that have those features, all of these features, could be the, an epigenetic alteration called DNA hypermethylation. So, DNA hypermethylation could cause genomic instability, increase, upper, increase in proliferation, and mostly an advantage in development to the cells affected by it. So, we did a study, this was part of me, my PhD thesis. We used a split mode design to compare the effect of CMI on the methylation status of, of P16 and NGMT, who are two well-known tumor suppressor genes. One sample was taken for the borders of a CTU here. And the control was in the very same patient on the clinically healthy mucosa on the contralateral side of the same individual, but this, this side has to be devoid of CMI. If you remember our criteria, we, we can say with security that this, 
here we have a lesion and here we have so here we have trauma acting here we don't so we found more hypermethylation of both mgmt and p16 on ctu than we found in mucosa devoid free of cmi the hypermethylation of both these tumor suppressor genes could lead to genetic silencing which con could contribute to the malignant transformation offered by CMI. Another study showed telomerase, telomerase activity in oral cancer, oral potentially malignant disorders, and normal mucosa. They found that in all groups, in this case, the study group was oral cancer and oral potentially malignant disorder, and the control group was, again, clinical samples taken, but clinical normal mucosa, they found that in all groups, the presence of chronic mechanical irritation, immunosuclinically showed more intense telomerase activity when CMI was present, with both statistically significant difference in the study group and the control group. Increased telomerase activity could lead to unlimited replication potential, so this could again foster malignant transformation. So, in order to sum up the biological pathways, is, could CMI be considered a carcinogen? This, uh, the International Association for Research on Oral Cancer, the ERC, proposed 11 items to consider if some given agent could be considered carcinogenic. The first one that you can see here does not apply, but the rest of them, for the rest of them, it, some evidence, if not a lot, but some evidence ex exists to support that. For example, a CMI could be genotoxic, genoto genotoxic because a, 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 a couple of studies, but Choi Pravanuta et al. show that a trauma could produce the presence of micronuclei. A, as you can see, uh, it also, CMI has the potential to uh, alter DNA repair as the hypermethylation of MGMT and P16. Uh, CMI could induce oxidative stress by means of the chronic inflammation that is relating to its presence. So, as you can see, but for all the key features that that are described for a factor to be considered carcinogenic, carcinogenic, there are at least some evidence. For example, there is no specific study on oxidative stress and CMI, but another oral diseases hmm, that produce chronic inflammation were, are already related to as the mechanism that could produce a malignant transformation. And as we mentioned, chronic mechanical irritation, some lesions of it may, may produce it. So it can be said that at least there is some growing body of evidence that could ex help to explain this. But the study, the research on chronic mechanical irritation have several a limitation imposed by the very nature of chronic mechanical irritation. Most of the studies uh, dealing with oral potentially malignant disorders are, uh, can be done because over, over OPMD are long-lasting conditions and could be studies using cohort prospective studies in which a follow-up could be done properly from to study leukoplakias, oral-lacking planus, and sumocus fibrosis to see if a particular group have undergone malignant transformation. However, traumatic lesions usually result with a simple and fast and safe procedures. So there is no possibility to do follow-up studying because it is unable for an ethical reason to leave an active CMI lesions untreated. So it's not feasible to do prospective studies for CMI because it's impossible to, to do it, which 
leaves restricted to animal studies. And as you can uh, probably guess, extrapolation from these studies should be done with caution. We have mentioned a couple of uh, animal studies that use that. So this also produced that there is a current scarcity of original studies. Um, there's some possible bias in the case, particularly in case control study, because there is a, a, gay, a great heterogeneity as to how CMI was recorded. Um, in some studies, they use a number of affected cheese. In some studies, they use, they mention only the affected cheese for dangerous, but they not specify as to how they measure, they define it. So all, all of this cause that uh, we have some limitations and the methodology that should be used to study CMI and, and oral cancer somehow is have to be different from the ones we use for <clears throat> the well-known oral potentially malignant disorders such as leukoplakia. So in this uh, letter to editor that we have sent recently, the discussion, the discussion about CMI and oral cancer continues, which prompted us to send this letter to the editor highlighting that more bio biomolecular evidence is needed to explain the process as to how CMI could produce or foster oral carcinogenesis. An example of an important limitation besides the inability, as we mentioned, to do follow-up studies is that uh, that CTU, particularly when studying CTU as, as a lesion of honorable potential in malignant lesion, is that most, most of the CTU lesions has less than two centimeters of size. Whereas at the lower level, more than 50% of the oral cancer are diagnosed in, size, in sizes greater or far greater than two centimeters. Most of the can cancers in the world are T T3 or T4 at the time of initial diagnosis. So, if indeed a chronic traumatic ulcer could be the precursor lesion of oral cancer, it is likely that when a malignancy is identified, tumor growth ha had completely changed the phenotype of the CTU, hindering its identification and likely producing bias because in this particular case with tumor growth, we cannot see any of the characteristic of the chronic mitic ulcer. So this is another serious limitation for CMI study on malignant transformation. Briefly, the clinical relevance that we believe that CMI have. The general dental practitioner who have a relevant role in not only preventing malignant transformation, but when the CMI is properly treated, it could prove unnecessary to perform a biopsy if a traumatic lesion heals only with easy, safe, simple method. But, but removing CMI, as you can see the photo on the left, you can see an, an ulcer and removing, in this case, the uh, the sharp teeth responsible for the lesion was attracted, and after a little less than two weeks, the lesion completely, almost completely resolved. But this is not uh, true, not, not only for CMI produced lesions. As you can see here, furthermore, in individuals with other oral potentially malignant disorders, in this case, you can see a leukoplakia, an heterogeneous one, Proper treatment of the mechanical injury factors could be an important measure to reduce the risk of oral cancer. In here, you can see on the right, uh, red and white lesion hmm, that uh, were in, in, in relation with CMI and we were treated with using polishing the, the teeth and also using a soft, soft splint to prevent the irritation and after two weeks you can see that not only the lesion reduce its size but only the red areas that area that are uh, 
areas that worries uh, a lot in thinking on the possibility of malignant transformation were also reused. So CNI is not only important for the, the lesion that they can, it can directly produce, but for the modification, for the alteration that it could have on another or potentially malignant disorders. So in order to close in, all things considered, the evidence available so far does not allow to fully prove the relationship between CMI and oral squamous cell carcinoma. The epidemiological evidence is still somehow not enough. The biological process involved are not all clarified just yet, but we now have clear guidelines as to how to properly address the research. And there are, there are no high evidence studies that refute this association. Indeed, they are by far more studies than support this association. How can the research between CMI and OSCC could be improved? Paraphrasing Dr. Aguirre Risa, the Spanish, if you can convince them, at least try to create some confusion. <laughs> So that's what I'm here for, to call it a seed of doubt, a scientific curiosity. So this is how uh, we believe that the story dealing with this uh, interest topic could be improved to determine the strength of the association uh, 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 using case control studies, see, um, the Recording of the CMI should be done with as much detail as tobacco and alcohol, see, using a clear, objective, and defined and validated definition for CMI, and also mentioning CMI at time of actions. See, so the recording of CMI should be systematically done in all institute studies dealing with CMI, with uh, oral potentially malignant disorder and oral cancer. So finally, I want to leave you with the following question. In your professional practice, how many of your oral cancer patients have a healthy and complete dentition with periodontal health, free of malposition, diastemas, functional habits, do you have this data? If you can answer this in full and can compare the OSCC with a control group, you surely are able to contribute specific evidence to analyze the relationship between CMI and oral cancer. By the way, as you, as you know, it is a known fact that oral cancer patients, they have, have um, well, we can say a bad state of it, their mouth. So, I would like to mention also uh, uh, thanks to uh, our group. Dr. Wispen was the founder of the oral medicine school in Argentina, and he has developed a long and fruitful work that spanned six weeks, six uh, books on oral medicine. And this is our group. And I'd also like to mention Dr. Lanfranchi, who has passed away a couple of years ago, who was our mentor and who fueled us with scientific curiosity and to be able to produce the lesions that we can, the studies and the lesions that we are dealing with now. And Dr. Panico, Dr. Gilligan, Dr. Piemonte, and others from from our oral medicine service that help us to 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 take to tackle this topic with passion and perseverance. So, thank you. That that was a great lecture, by the way, and really covered everything very well. And uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Tilakratne sir, will you please uh, give your opinion and your thoughts first, and then we'll take the questions. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, it is, I think, a very good lecture. You covered almost everything as uh, Mandana said. Uh, yes, I think this is a concept, as you correctly said, 
people have been discussing arguing for decades right i remember even when we were students uh, about 35 or more years back uh, still this the question whether chronic irritation is a cause for carcinogenesis in the oral cavity uh, was questioned but you know after about 3 or 4 decades still we are perhaps more or less at the same place because we we don't have much uh, evidence but you very nicely started with the definition and the given causes of cmi and the clinical scenarios the epidemiology and bit uh, of a touch of uh, uh, laboratory investigations you try to convince the audience that mechanical irritation uh, chronic mechanical irritation is perhaps play a role i i personally if you ask me whether i believe in chronic uh, mechanical irritation and carcinogenesis uh, mm -hmm. my answer is more biased towards yes because if you look at uh, rest of the body we, you don't have to go far you just go down to uh, the gastric cancer gastric mm -hmm. cancer is you know gastric cancer occurs in the background of inflammation right yes. uh, evoked by uh, helicobacter pylori so that inflammation there is no argument now everybody agrees that inflammation leads to a gastric cancer not in everybody but a minority of people who have inflammation uh, going to get cancer now what do we expect in chronic mechanical irritation what happens actually underlying pathology is again perhaps lead into chronic inflammation if it does so we have no reason not to believe at least to some extent perhaps this plays a role but unfortunately we do not have good either clinical epidemiological or molecular studies to prove it that is where the problem is that is what the the problem the iac team uh, had when they were trying to you know look for evidence to uh, get this as a definite uh so uh, etiological factor for carcinogenesis but that is not the case but i am very sure uh, all the factors that we mentioned in the oral cavity at the end of the day what it does is it evoke inflammation right so there are a lot of studies on opmd especially uh, mm -hmm. suggesting the role of various inflammatory cytokines uh lead into uh, carcinogenesis right even in the background of submucous fibrosis we have shown the effects of uh, interleukins for example and various other cytokines yeah. uh, uh <laughs> causing dna double strand breaks and lead into carcinogenesis so therefore i think what we need is we need uh, more and more studies uh to decide whether this is a reality whether this is a fact or fiction right so that that we need more studies but some of the interesting things that uh, the jeremina said the lesions which are hyperplastic uh, lead to a carcinogenesis in the background of cmi than lesions which are flat or not uh, proliferative you know uh, that's a good statement but again that is where we need more molecular research you see now if you believe in that concept you know it is not difficult for these young researchers to come and do you know select cmi lesions which are hyperplastic and select cmi lesions which are not and then you know compare uh, the, the various you know the hallmark genes uh, what changes are taking place so that that's not a difficult study and also another point jeremino you said that i yes. had some questions on is uh, uh, i think it is one of your study you, you studied the lesions after taking off the traumatic course if the lesions exist then you biopsy them for the study either you or whatever the, the whoever the research group now you know there is a little problem uh, in my mind for that in the uh, selecting that cohort because 
you know if it is a true traumatic ulcer yes once you remove the 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 source of irritation it should disappear so you need to exclude the possibility of you know that probably being uh, started as a neoplastic process and the, your trauma is uh, not a secondary uh, event so that you know the sample selection you have to be very careful otherwise it will be a slightly you know uh, study with some bias uh, so that th there are various areas where we are people can do uh, research on but if you look at now the iac evidence uh, you showed actually the, the we have some evidence uh, possible evidence for carcinogenesis in the background of cmi uh, you know people have shown there is you know chronic inflammation by uh, demonstrating various inflammatory molecules present and some people have done uh, studies to show very few to show that there are reactive oxygen species generation in the background of cmi and very slim evidence to say there is possible immortalization uh, you know and and problems with dna repair mechanism so some you know the very uh, little evidence not very strong with uh, good studies but there is some evidence available out there so the what is important is for people to go and do more, more and more studies but if you look at all other things that we are now uh, considering as emerging risk factors for cancer the oral cancer like oral yes. microbiome right if you take oral microbiome so there is again nothing else oral microbiome uh, gives rise to a lot of inflammation these inflammatory molecules you know induce various mm -hmm. pathways like you know nf kappa b uh, uh, map kinase various inflammatory pathways exaggerated then it gives rise to more and more inflammatory uh, the cytokines so that perhaps uh, in, in induce carcinogenesis right so the, not only microbiome if you look at other mm -hmm. other imaging factors also that is uh, that is the case so therefore i think this is a very good area jerome you know you i think uh, try to touch on all the areas i think that was wonderful i think that would have given some insight for the young researchers uh, to get some ideas and to you know come forward and do uh, better studies you know uh, for, for us to prove this actually we have to have good prospective studies with uh, you know the molecular profiling so that is the way forward no not retrospect of course we can't do retrospective studies that's uh, wasted but we need to have good prospective studies long term ones the the, the going for 5 to 10 years uh, and looking at the molecular changes in sequential uh, biopsies uh, I, i'm i'm sure the people should be able to convince now this is a reality uh, the perhaps uh, so if you if you look at chronic periodontal disease and the relationship of that to oral cancer you know the we, we know some periodontal bacteria you know like uh, p gingivalis pivotella uh, uh, and th th those are two main bacteria which uh, are implicated in carcinogenesis so what they do is again as i said earlier they again induce the inflammatory pathways so therefore the chronic mechanical irritation perhaps uh, mediate its carcinogenesis to my understanding uh, if it is uh, if it does so i think through inflammatory pathways so that is what i feel so we need but more and more research Yes, indeed. So, uh, well, two things. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dilagratin, for your insights. <laughs> uh, you, we, we, we believe that you can always learn from suggestion and discussion with experts. And we are mainly clinicians. We we do some work at the laboratory, but when we many clinicians, but we we know we are lucky enough to know uh, many well-trained, well-renowned. Uh, or a pathologist like Ronald, because Ronald is a very good friend of us. But one thing, pro prospective studies, as we mentioned, are not feasible in humans, because we cannot leave an active traumatic lesion untreated to, to do the follow-up. So the studies that you can do in the rest of the oral potential malignant lesions, such as leukoplakia, oral leukoplakia, that 
most of the cases, whatever you do, the lesions are going to linger, are going to persist. With trauma, you can just say, you can just take a patient with a lesion and, and leave him untreated. So that a possibility to do prospective studies, it's only feasible in uh, an animal setup, not in, in patients. Uh, that's why uh, all the, um, the bi biomolecular studies that I have shown you and other that we done and other that uh, have been done by other researchers are uh, to take uh, cross-sectional studies or that's why because uh, uh, the study of CMI is very specific but because a difference to, to all the oral, oral OPMD it has a specific action site. When a patient smokes, when a patient drinks, they act, they, those substances act in, all, in the whole oral cavity. Whereas CMI, you can define exactly. Here you have trauma, here you don't. So you, you can study in the same patients the action with, in the site affected by trauma and the site not affected by it and compare them, that, that's why I did. So <laughs> I'm hoping to be able to, to show you that research later on. And, and the second one that you, you say about uh, the study about chronic traumatic ulcers, that uh, maybe in the first time we, we seen the lesions could be indeed already be a malignant lesions, is, is that, uh, that uh, Initially, we in, in all of the patients that we should suspect that there is a possibility of malignant transformation, or there is a even small possibility of there it being a malignant uh, lesion, we do a biopsy, and sometimes we, before that we do a many cytologies to see. So, in the in both cases that we have, I have shown you in the study that we are about to be published. We believe, and we we found in the histopathology most of the border of the lesion, the, the fertile border, with characteristics that are compatible with a non-specific chronic reactive lesion, and in one small part, a microinvasive squamous cell carcinoma. I I get it that still could be the case, but in a, in a big lesion that you only have one small part, it could be an indicator that this cancer is indeed burning, if you allow me the, <laughs> the, the word, is, is uh, growing from that particular lesion. But yes, we still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I will take some of the audience uh, questions. Uh, I'll bring this one first because I think it was in relation to what you were just talking about. Professor Hillier says it looks as if comparative DNA methylation studies should be envisaged and definitely used. And he also had a question earlier now that I will bring as per the order that it was. It was yeah. about the erosive lichen planus case, yes. So were there similar lichenoid, uh, symmetrical lichenoid lesions on the other side? Yes, yes, there were. It was a patient that we have been submitted to a follow-up for more than 10 years, I have seen this in the oral medicine service in the college, dentistry college. And so we have a, a, a mass in this particular case, more than one biopsy showing that there is uh, oral lichen planus. Yes, yes, we have. And there were semantical lesions on the other buccal mucosa and other sites in tongue also. I haven't shown it, but because of time, restrictions but i have the many full full cases that showing how cma could alter the phenotype of an all mpd such as oral like implants i think this was <laughs> from your own team right Dr. yes, yes. Was, yes. Really <laughs> okay so that was that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, Dr. Akshay is asking, curious to know in the split mouth design, the study for P16 and MGMT DNA hypermethylation in chronic traumatic ulcer, was the study an immunohistochemical or any other advanced techniques used? Ah, yes, yes, sorry. It was on the slide, but um, uh, we use a 
qualitative qPCR, real-time PCR, with a visual feed treatment that, that which is a process specific to study hyperventilation. We do we did that in a, a laboratory of Chile, uh, belonging to the doctor Marcela Hernandez Rios, which is a very well renowned uh, expert on hyperventilation and epigenetic alterations. So yes, yes, we, we use PCR technique, real time PCR, which is a whole <laughs> uh, different and a whole uh, technique that has is very specific points that is not easy to deal with. <laughs> Uh, we have one from Dr. Arpan Shah. So he's asking, uh, we have encountered OSCC lesions due to CMI in few diabetic patients. Could diabetes be a contributing factor for carcinogenesis in CMI-induced lesions? Whoa, whoa, what a good question. We, indeed, we believe that it can. In the, in the study of about chronic traumatic ulcers and malignant transformation, uh, one of the reviewers actually asked us about this, and we have found some uh, evidence that uh, diabetic patients who have many, many processes altered that could ease or could a uh, malignant transformation. Uh, for example, uh, David Griffin, who was the Argentinian who first mentioned chronic traumatic ulcer as a potential malignant lesion, uh, specifically said that it has more possibility of malignant transformation when those lesions develop on diabetic patients, especially the ones who are not well treated or who are not uh, doing the treatment so well. So if anytime you want to jump in, please just, uh, if you want to add to something, please just do so. Um, okay. So, I think Dr. Tilakratna, you're still having a problem hearing, sir? Uh, I, I can't hear. Actually, very faint. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, what, what, did you, what did you ask? No, no, no. I said if you have at any point you want to add anything to the discussion, just uh, maybe raise your hand so I know you want to get in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I think it's okay. a problem because you can't hear us. Okay, sir. yes. Okay, we have one from Dr. Akshay. Uh, can you guide on how to suspect an early invasive SCC clinically in a CTU as it can be only confirmed by histopathology? Yes, indeed. As, as we mentioned just, just before, uh, when a malignant lesion has certain size, uh, it, the, pro the growth of the malignant lesion has probably masked all the CTU characteristics. So in order to be able to suspect that uh, when you have a patient with a lesion as big as maybe to be, to be masking the CTU characteristic, the only thing that you have to maybe suggest that could be a traumatic lesion before is the anamnesis, the history of the patient. Usually the patient uh, can re can remember if there was a missing tick or if he began to use a defective tension that, that injured the tongue border. So that's the, the way that you can infer. By no means that is definitive, but uh, in most of the cases that we have, I have shown to you, the, the temporality is, uh, according to Bradford Hill uh, criteria for causality, is the one of the only criteria that should be present always. So that means that first you have to have the cause in this, in our particular case, the chronic mechanical irritation factor, and later on, the consequences has to be developed. So, so that, that has <laughs> added, yeah, sorry. Professor Joss has added uh, as a su suggestion to try transepithelial brush biopsy liquid-based cytology to find out whether it is my, uh, uh, well yes. as a matter of fact my the my phd thesis on epigenetic alterations the p16 and the mgmt was done not on biopsy material but using 
brush cytologies. That was <laughs> an, another original part because uh, we want to see, control the patient to do a follow up to see if the patient later on heal or it was necessary to do a biopsy. In all of the patients that I have mentioned in that particular group, we do a complete follow up to see the full resolution of the lesion. And if not, we did a biopsy. But the results that I have shown you for epigenetic alteration were used a uh, brush uh, cytology. Yes, yes, yes. We, well, well, that's what we use as a rule, as a defective, <laughs> as, as a rule for a uh, for do satology now. <laughs> we don't use anything else <laughs> for that. You can get together with Professor Joss. He does a lot of work on this. Yeah, and he has one more question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Would parafunctional dysfunctional habits involving the tongue in young females with poor lingual occlusion following unsatisfactory orthodontic correction potentially play a role in carcinogenesis? Well, I will say not only in females, <laughs> in both sexes, but uh, we have seen, we have uh, not published yet that uh, patients with uh, malposition, with, mal with poor, uh, poor occlusions, who have many malpositions, and particularly the lack of a uh, canine guide uh, occlusion, that is the two canines that can produce the, the, the necessary separation when there is a jaw movement, uh, produces more lesions because it allows the contact with mucosa with the teeth. We have seen that many, many times. Okay, we have a question from Dr. Raghu. So it might be worth considering, oh, it's a comment, uh, the relationship between pro-inflammatory mediators such as interleukin-6 and 8 and uh, tumor necrosis factor in a chronic wound versus non-healing wound? Well, actually, <laughs> originally the plan for my, for my PhD thesis was to study some inflammatory cytokines and nuclear factor kappa B and some of, of this one, but then again for uh, <laughs> um, basically uh, many reasons we, we haven't even to them, but we really want to do some study uh, comparing the inflammatory background of a CMA lesion and a control one. Yes, yes, we, we definitely should and want and will do that. <laughs> okay, one more suggestion from Dr. Raghu. It would be properly, particularly interested in the matrix degradation and invadopodia formation in these cases versus those that are habit induced. Well, there is only one uh, study like that I can recall that th th not th they did not study uh, infiltration or invasion, but uh, compare the pro prognostic of the patients of cancer patients unaffected by CNI and those with, with chronic trauma. And the study showed that uh, the patient with trauma had poorer prognosis, uh, more mortality and more morbidity and the higher rates. Yeah, but there is only one study that I can f think of that so there's not much <laughs> on it. <laughs> yes, definitely is something that should be studied. Yes. Uh... Dr. Tilakratna, so you have anything you would like to add? Actually, one thing that I forgot to tell is uh, the whether there is a possible role of carcinogenesis in submucous fibrosis due to chronic irritation. Right? Because uh, some people have hypothesized, you know, that's uh, the, one of the reasons why you get uh, increased prevalence of uh, oral cancer in submucous fibrosis is probably due to chronic irritation. Uh, I don't think it is the primary cause, but people have no. identified various pathways and definite carcinogens are there from ericoline and guacin and guacolin. But in addition to that, whether this is a cofactor, like, you know, the role of uh, the uh, synergistic factor, like role of alcohol, to synergize the uh, the carcinogenic effects of tobacco in oral cancer, whether chronic mechanical irritation does that kind of a role, 
that probably is the possible thing rather than a primary cause it probably a, a, you know the possible synergistic uh, the factor in oral carcinogenesis i think that again the, the research are lacking to investigate the the aspects of chronic irritation caused by arachnoid uh, chewing and yes. the carcinogenesis in the background of submucous fibrosis again that is a good area for research for those who are listening the younger researchers i think yes yes indeed uh, the uh, the uh, risk factor for all cancer that are not able to produce mutations to directly affect dna are usually dismissed some some researchers when we have discussed the topic they say no uh, cmi cannot produce a mutation so it can be a carcinogenic yes that is true it can't it can't it probably can't induce mutation but we believe that uh, both initiation and promotion are needed if you have a patient have a, a cell that is initiated if that particular affected cell with mutations because of tobacco because of alcohol or other other, other features but if this cell is initiation if it doesn't receive uh and stimuli and stimuli to reproduce to have mitosis maybe that patient that particular cell it will go on and die and we and we see to a six but with the very same initiated cell but other cultures is affected by cmi inducing proliferation and this chronic inflammatory state then you can have the cancer so we, we, we can at least saying that uh, CMI could be important because in some patients only the presence of CMI could induce that in, uh, already initiated cell to produce the cancer. By no means, please, I wanted to be clear of that, are we saying that CMI is the main and only factor? No. <laughs> but we say that it can have definitely have a very important role. But as you, Dr. Tilagarakta said, we still have a long way to go from that. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. <laughs> so we have one last couple of comments. One is from a friend at Hacked and to Speak. Ah, yes. yeah. Hi. <laughs> he is uh, actually, uh, yeah, I guess this is what all of us are a little scared of, is that dentists and our treatment could be adding to the whole mix there of possibly causing some of the trauma that then causes or adds to a possibility of cancer and then we have one from dr daniel yeah late diagnosis is a problem worldwide when we talk about oral cancer this is also the reality here in brazil there is uh, is there any feasibility on measuring trauma relevance in advanced tumor development okay uh, what you can do uh, it's mainly basically and let me just <laughs> say this again cmi trauma has not been uh, usually studied in studied about oral cancer so if you can in in your place of work in your cancer patient began to record cmi presence you already are doing a lot of to to answer this particular question because this is in the oral cancer groups from throughout the world they mention oral cancer uh, alcohol tobacco consumption they mention hpv they mention diet they mention socioeconomic status but there are very few studies that actually record cmi and those who actually did that who actually recorded cmi Sadly, they usually have at what we call an um, um, not very uh, ordinated, not very suitable criteria to determine CMI presence. So we, that's why we propose and take a very long time to think about the how as to how define where there is CMI and where is there is not. Um, and because uh, referring to the uh, comment before this. Dr. Dan, Dan Goldenberg, the one before, I don't remember the name, but um, it is important uh, that uh, CMI is important because um, 
it pertains to all dentistry, no matter which which uh, particular area of dentistry that you practice on. The dentists are the only ones responsible to prevent it, identify it, and able to treat it. No other specialty could do that. Maybe some speech therapist in patient where we then identify some, uh, for example, swallowing disorders. We use a lot. We work a lot with speech therapists, but mainly identification, prevention, and treatment of CMI lesions, whatever it may be, whatever it may be on oral cancer, on oral potential and malignant disorder, or clinical health and because on the patient devoid of all those lesions, the dentist is the only one who can do that. So we believe that this is relevant to all dentists professional alike. Oh, thank you. Dr. There's a lot of, yes, there, there is actually only his I have, but uh, there's a lot of comments throughout that says uh, has the same feeling, expresses the same feeling and the same thought that it was a very good lecture uh, with uh, very well presented actually and with a uh, lot of data which is there. And I think like Sir also said, like Dr. Tilak Ratna said, it's given a lot of idea hopefully to the youngsters to start working on this. Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> Oh, okay. you know, once we have more hands on, then probably the uh, the details we want will be found faster. Indeed, indeed, we hope, we hope. Yes. I will be, I mean, we will be, we are actually working on at least four publications on the topic that I, I like. I'm hoping that I will be able to share with you soon. Dr. Tilagrakne, thank you for insight and comments. Uh, I'm really happy to and honored to have you as a guest in my my conference, my humble conference. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, so uh, well, as, as we we if you allow me, as we are mainly clinicians, um, we really need the work and input some from people who are specialized in oral pathology because they as there are some things that we may miss and we may not think about that an oral pathologist <laughs> is able to see that like some of the, doc the comments that Dr. Tilakarati have made. <laughs> and then the, the opposite is true. Some things that we as clinicians we see are very obvious. Maybe when the, you have a, a slide on the microscope, you, you cannot uh, be able to think about. So an interaction is really much needed. It's the only way to produce some good evidence, whether it's for or against it. That is true. So we had a good day. We have had people from across the globe. And I think this time was more appropriate for our friends in the Latin America. So we have had a lot of friends from there. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to now wrap it up with a thank you to everyone. But just give me a minute to share your... Yes. So thank you so much, Dr. Azos. This was really very nice. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for you for an invitation, Dr. Mandana. You are so You're welcome. welcome. <laughs> yes. And uh, sir, here is your certificate. You can add it to your collection. I think you're going to have a little book from me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll eventually give it to you as a book, I think. So you can have it as a record. <laughs> okay. And, uh, That's a good one. Now to, yes, all our audience, thank you so much for staying with us. We had a long session, but as I can see, everyone stayed. So that was really nice. It was interesting, but also nice of you to have stayed. Everyone, please, if you liked the lecture, please remember to hit like so that Dr. Bezos <laughs> knows that you liked it. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and enjoy yourself. Thank you again. Thank you, sir, for coming through again as usual. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. you. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a great you. one. Be well. Bye.